when I was helping operate on Kennedy, I rushed in with my regular clothes on. Mm -hmm. And so I stood at the head of the cart where he was lying and blood was running down my front. So my entire suit was soaked in blood. My wife the next day took it to a cleaner's and the man recognized what it was. He says, are you going to have this cleaned? And she said, my husband only has one other suit. And so they cleaned that, but kept the shirt that I was wearing. That's, that's Kennedy's blood. Jesus, Lord, may I touch it? Mm-hmm. My God. The sangre del Presidente Kennedy. Um, Dr. Wilbersley, on the air, appreciated the, the fact that you gave us this opportunity to talk to, to you, especially on this historic date. Um, just tell me, you know, take us there. I mean, uh, just uh, oh, on that you, day. You, you got up. You got up in the morning and just take, a it, take, day. It, take it from there. Another day. We knew the president was coming into Dallas, uh, but we never knew we would have the association that we had. So that day, I was in the operating room at Parkland, uh, and I was showing a movie about how to repair a hiatus hernia to some of the surgery residents. And I heard a little knock on the door of the conference room where I was showing that movie. And I went to the door, and one of our other residents was standing there, and he said, would you step outside? I need to tell you something. And I said, sure. So I went and turned off the movie projector and stepped back outside, and he said they have just called the emergency room and said they're bringing President Kennedy in, that he's been shot during his motorcade downtown. And they want all the faculty surgeons. And I was on my second year on the faculty as a surgery professor at Southwestern Medical School in Parkland uh, at that time. So I was two days past my 34th birthday. A very young and very wet behind the ears and very green. So anyway, we got on the elevator and rode down two floors to the emergency room. And uh, when we got off the elevator, we stepped out into a very large area, about 40 or 50 feet on each side, uh, surrounded by patient examination cubicles. And I saw something there in that large area I'd never seen before. A large crowd of people, men in business suits like yourself, standing there, uh, shoulder to shoulder, packed into that space. I'd never seen anything like that. And so as I stood there and watched that, uh, the crowd spontaneously opened up and made a little corridor uh, down to a hallway that extended off of that big area. And on each side of that hallway there were uh, operating rooms, emergency operating rooms for people that had been gravely injured or shot or whatever so that we could operate on them right there in the emergency room. Well, sitting on a folding chair outside of a trauma room, uh, also called the operating room, uh, was Mrs. Kennedy sitting in uh, her bloody clothing there. And I thought to myself, my God, this is just what they said it was. So I walked down toward her, and it occurred to me as I was walking toward her that um, I knew my chief of surgery, Dr. Shires, was in Galveston at a meeting. Uh, my two other associates, on, uh, there were only four faculty members at that time in surgery, and now we have more than 56 or 57, so a much smaller place. And I thought they were probably outside of the hospital at that time, it being noon. Uh, that meant I might be the only surgeon there. So I literally had to force myself to keep walking toward Mrs. Kennedy. And um, standing there at the doorway where she, outside of where she was sitting, was Mrs. Nelson, who was our a uh, nurse who was in charge of the emergency room, and she was standing between two Secret Service men. I figured that from their lapel things that they had. And she was letting them know who to let go by into trauma room one. Uh, and they waved me on through, and I walked into trauma room one, pushed the door open, walked by Mrs. Kennedy. And when I opened that door, I saw the horrific sight of the president lying there on that cart uh, with a light on his bloody head. And um, at the same time I was horrified by that sight, 
I was gratified to see that my other two associates, Dr. Perry and Dr. Baxter, had just preceded me into the room. And they were getting ready to explore a wound in the president's neck, right where I'm pointing, just next to his windpipe and just above his collarbone. Uh, and as I walked by, Dr. Perry, who was preparing to make an incision through this for us to look at it and put a tracheostomy in, and we were mainly concerned about the blood supply to the brain. Now, they had not had time to do anything but see that wound. And so Dr. Perry uh, handed me a surgical retractor as I walked by and said, would you go to the head of the cart and lean over and put this retractor in this incision we're going to make to look at this wound right here? And I said, sure, I'll do that. And I put myself at the head of the cart. And as soon as I got there, I said to Dr. Perry and Dr. Baxter, I said, my God, have you seen this wound in his head? I said, the back of his head on the right side is missing. And the back part of his brain is gone. I could look down into his empty skull. And so it was obvious that this was uh, an irretrievable, untreatable wound. But they completed what they did here in the neck. Um, and at, just as they did that, Dr. Clark, who was our neurosurgery professor, had come into the room where we were working and stood next to all of us there to the right of the cart that the president was lying on and um, watched the electrocardiographic activity that the president had. Many people have said, well, he was dead, wasn't he, when he came into the room? No, he was not. I mean, he had an unsalvageable wound, but he was still making attempts to breathe, and he even had excellent cardiac activity on the electrocardiogram. So he was not technically dead. But oh, about five or six minutes into that exploration, his electrocardiogram straight line, and he did die at that point. So Dr. Perry said to Dr. Perry, uh, Dr. Perry, uh, Dr. Clark said to Dr. Perry, Mac, you can stop now because he's gone. Those are his exact words uh, to the president. Well, with that, all of us moved away uh, from the president. And the room that we were in had been become packed with people most of whom are not supposed to be in there, despite the Secret Service men who were trying to keep them out. A crowd of people had surged into the room, just curiosity seekers, so that that room where we were working was jammed with people. But after the president was pronounced dead, they all began to surge out. And um, so Dr. Baxter and I, when that crowd began to surge out, we were pushed against the wall of Trauma Room 1 by the cart. The, the cart was being pushed against the wall by that crowd leaving the room. So Dr. Baxter and I had to stand there while everybody else left. And just, then after they had all left, we pushed the cart away so we could walk around it and leave ourselves. But before we did that, the door opened again to trauma room one, and a priest came in uh, and walked over to the head of the cart where the president was lying uncovered his face, the sheet had been pulled over it, anointed his forehead, and began to give him the last rites. And Dr. Baxter and I stood there, we were about as far as where I am from you, or even closer. Uh, we felt it was inappropriate that we were there, but we couldn't get out. We were trapped, so to speak. So we uh, had to listen to what was going on. And Father Huber, we later found out that, that was the priest's name, uh, leaned over to the president's left ear and said only one phrase that I could understand or hear. And that was, he said, if thou livest, emphasizing the word if. And then his voice dropped and I couldn't hear what else he said. But he completed uh, that um, absolution. And... Um, then was preparing to leave himself. And uh, before he could do that, though, the door came open to trauma room one again, and Mrs. Kennedy came in. And she stood across from Dr. Baxter and me and next to Father Huber, and I couldn't hear anything she said. She spoke in such a soft voice. But um, from Father Huber's answer to her, I knew she had asked 
if he had received last rites, if the president had received last rites. And Father Huber said, yes, I've given him conditional absolution, emphasizing conditional. Mrs. Kennedy didn't say anything, but she grimaced when she heard that word conditional. She was not happy with that, but she didn't say anything. She stood there, very dignified lady, completely in command of herself. I was very upset when I saw this movie recently, Parkland, where they had her being in hysterics and throwing herself over the president's body, and she did not do that. Uh, she was very, I'm not saying she was cold, she was just in command of herself. Dignified. Yeah, and so uh, she stood there for a few moments and then exchanged a ring from her finger onto the president's finger and a ring from his finger onto her finger. And she stood there for a moment and then walked slowly down to the foot of the cart and the president's bare right foot was protruding out from underneath the sheet. And she stood by his foot there for a moment and then leaned over and kissed his bare foot and walked out of the room. That's the last we saw of her and that's what happened in trauma room one that we were uh, inappropriately witness to for sharing this with us in such a candid way and to clarify and stuff that sometimes we watch on TV it belongs to the world it's not my information it's information that belongs to the world tell me um, just retracting a little bit towards the when you're doing the examination and you're looking at the president's head um, um, you know how many people say they think they know what they happen or whatever um, you're looking at the head, you're holding his head. Is, is it an exit wound? Is it an outside wound? What is your... It. What I was doing, I was leaning over with this retractor in this incision mm -hmm. so they could see the blood vessel that they were looking at that supplied blood to the brain. And of course that continued only for about five or six minutes before his electrocardiographic activity disappeared and Dr. Clark pronounced him dead. And so but I was not holding his head, but I was probably about 18 inches above and behind so I could look down into his face and into his wound in his head. And as I looked at him, um, the, I could see that the back part of the brain on the right side was gone. In fact, Mrs. Kennedy came into uh, the trauma room carrying a large portion of his brain in her hand and handed it. Uh, to Dr. Jenkins, who was our anesthesiology professor who had come in and was breathing for the professor, uh, for the president, while I was standing there next to him. So um, anyway, that lasted a very short time, and then the president was pronounced dead, and everybody left the room. But um, in the um, anatomical uh, sense, I mean, the neck... Uh, was it an exit wound or the, or the, or the shot of the head? Or they said like, well, what I'm getting at is that, in your opinion, was yeah. it shot from the back or from the front? Well, that's a critical question. And of course, you know, now does that mean is there one or two shooters? Is there no conspiracy or a conspiracy? And I think most people feel now, in fact, the official version from the House Select Committee on Assassinations uh, in 1976 to 79, they studied that problem of whether there was a conspiracy, and they came to the conclusion in Congress that in all probability there was a conspiracy. Now, who set that up and who the, all the shooters were, uh, I don't know. I'm beginning to think, in fact, now, and that's another story, that Oswald was not one of the shooters, that he was set up to blame uh, the shooting on him, but that uh, probably the actual shooting was done by other people who more than likely were brought in by the Mafia under the auspices of Carlos Marcello, who was the head of the Mafia in uh, New Orleans, and then uh, worked through Joe Campisi uh, here in Dallas, uh, who was his underling in the Mafia. They brought the assassins over. In your, but in your professional opinion, do you believe, I mean, just because, I mean, you're closer than anybody here was there, I mean, uh, do you believe that, that one of the shots may have come from, from the head down to the straight line? Yes, and my other comment there, and this is just my worm's eye view, if you will, of it, 
uh, is that the first shot, and you can see this in the Zapruder film, which I'm sure you have seen, uh, as they make the turn uh, in the motorcade from Houston Street onto Elm Street, heading toward the triple underpass, the President and Mrs. Kennedy look all right then. Then all of a sudden, the first shot has hit him, and you see his hands go up to his neck like that. What I think happened then is probably from the sixth floor of the book depository, the first shot was fired uh, from the sixth floor, and that bullet hit him in the back about where I'm pointing and came out uh, through his neck, made the entrance wound, uh, the exit wound that we first thought was an entrance wound where I'm pointing my finger. That was the first shot. That was a survivable shot. That didn't cause any critical damage. But then the motorcade disappears after a few moments after that first shot is fired uh, behind a sign that's on the edge of uh, Elm Street. And after another moment or two, it comes from behind the sign. The president still has his hands up to his neck, and now Mrs. Kennedy is leaning over to him as if to ask, what's wrong? And just as she does that, the president's head literally explodes, and he's thrown violently backward and to the left. And I think that that shot was fired from behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll by a second shooter. And that bullet hit him about here and then blew out the back of his head. And that's what killed him. So yeah. those are the two shots. In the operating, um, in the, did you see an, an end or something? That's a good question. Um, and we did not see it because, as I said, as soon as he was pronounced dead, all of us left the room, uh, most of the people left the room, and we didn't get a chance uh, to examine him any further to look at his head and see where an entrance wound was. However, I have read just recently in a book uh, where they described the findings at the post-mortem exam at the Naval Hospital. And whoever is writing that comments, of course, about the nature of the wounds. And they did see a wound about here, which we did not get the opportunity to see. I think it must have been here, and it looks like that uh, on the Zapruder film that that bullet, second bullet, hit him here and knocked him backward and then blew out the back of his head. So while I didn't see the entrance wound, there were people in the post-mortem exam who described it, and uh, as well as describing the exit wound in the back of his head. How does that change you as a man? Well, again, I don't mean to, you know, uh, trivialize it, but that's what I was trained to do and did for many years. And so whenever something like this happens, no matter who it happens to, the president or the lowest person in the world, all you do, you don't stand and think, what do I think about this? You just begin to react medically. You begin to provide the treatment for whoever it is and whatever the injury is. You don't have time at that moment to think about it. You just go into a reactive mode medically and don't think about it at that time. Certainly later, very shortly after that, you begin to think about it. But I can't say that this is something that changed my view of life or changed my life or anything. I don't, as I said, I don't mean to trivialize it. It's just that that's what I did and that's what I did for many years. Um, and so I can't, whenever you're doing that sort of thing in medicine, you can't let yourself be affected too much emotionally by all the terrible things that you see uh, for, for whoever it involves. You know, you just can't, you can't let it uh, get you down too much emotionally. The Secret Service, uh, uh, and I'm sorry to ask you this, uh, do you need a break? Are you tired? Can we continue? Yeah. You're, you're fine? You're fine? <laughs> she likes green bananas. Yeah. But... Uh, the um, a lot has uh, are we ready? Go ahead. And uh, a lot has been said about the um, the way that the body was taken out of the hospital. Do you see in the movie like the getaway car and blah blah blah, and then Johnson order and blah blah blah? Rather than tell me again what Oliver Stone thinks or whatever Parkland thinks or whatever, what happened? Well, after the president was declared dead. Then Dr. Perry and Dr. Baxter and Dr. Paul Peters and one or two other doctors uh, came back up to the operating room and sat down uh, outside the nurse's station there and, 
and just looked at one another. And that's when it began to hit us what we had just seen and done. And as we sat there, uh, one of our associates, Dr. Rose, who was our forensic pathologist, came up from down in his office two floors below the operating room next to the emergency room and sat down with us and told us what he had just been involved in. And uh, where he had been um, was in his office that, uh, as I said, was just next to the emergency room. And it had a window that looked out onto an exit corridor uh, that went out to the loading dock. And they had pulled an ambulance up to that loading dock, uh, unbeknownst to Dr. Rose. But as he sat there and looked out through that window in his office onto the corridor outside his office, he saw this little procession coming along. Uh, and that consisted of uh, the cart that the president's body was on, only now it had been placed in a coffin that had been brought out uh, from a funeral home in town. And um, that uh, cart on the left side of it, Dr. Rose uh, said Mrs. Kennedy was walking. And in front of it were walking the two Secret Service men, one of whom was carrying uh, the two Secret Service men that I had seen when I went into Trauma Room 1. And they were leading the little procession. And then on the other side of the, of the gurney, the cart the president was on, were several of his friends who had flown down from Washington with him, Kenny O'Donnell and Dan Powers and several others. And Dr. Rose said he sort of reluctantly got up and went outside into the corridor from his office, held his hand up and said, um, I'm required legally to tell you that any murder that's committed in the state, uh, the victim must undergo a post-mortem here. Well, uh, Dr. Rose said nobody said anything to him, but the Secret Service man who was unencumbered by the machine gun, he was carrying, one of them was carrying a Thompson submachine gun. The other Secret Service man walked over to Dr. Rose, uh, didn't say anything to him, but put his hands underneath his armpits, lifted him gently up off the floor, and placed him over against the wall of the corridor and shook his finger in his hand in his face and then they turned and walked on out to the ambulance and back to put the president's body in Air Force One and back to Washington. So he grabbed the doctor and he pushed him against the wall. Picked him up, set him against the wall. Very gently, Dr. Rose said. He just picked him up like you would a small child. Dr. Rose was small and the Secret Service man was large. And so he picked him up, set him against the wall shook his finger in his face, didn't say anything to him, but it was obvious they were not planning to leave the president here in Dallas, and they didn't. And then what happened? They took him, and uh, tell me up until, I mean, what happened after? Well, they flew back to Washington, and Mrs. Kennedy said because uh, the president had been a naval officer, she wanted the postmortem to be done at the naval hospital that night, which they did uh, that, that night. And the next morning, I was sitting in my office with Dr. Perry, who was one of the other doctors working on the, on the president, and we had an office together. And we got a phone call from Washington from Dr. Boswell, one of the pathologists who performed the postmortem uh, in Washington. And he wanted to ask some questions about what we had done here, why we had enlarged this wound, and then he said to Dr. Perry, and I could, I could tell from Dr. Perry's answers what the questions were that Dr. Boswell had asked him. He asked Dr. Perry, did you know that there was a wound in the back? Um, because we had been thinking this was an entrance wound that we were exploring. And uh, Dr. Boswell said, no, that there was a wound in the back. So this was almost certainly an exit wound in his neck. And uh, Dr. Perry I said, no, we didn't know that because we didn't uh, examine, we didn't have time or the chance to examine his back. So that's what happened the next morning when we communicated or Dr. Perry communicated with the pathologist in, in uh, Washington. And then like, if destiny wasn't curious enough with you, my good friend, then you get to treat the 
gentleman that allegedly killed the president, didn't you? That's right. Well, two days later, on Sunday, after this had happened on Friday, uh, my wife and two small children had been to church. And we'd just gotten home and were planning to go out to lunch. And they were upstairs getting ready, and so I sat down in my living room. And as I did, I thought, well, I'll turn the television on and see what news there is now. And as I turned the television on, um, I could hear a voice before the picture formed. The voice was saying, he's been shot, he's been shot. And I thought, my, now what? And then the picture formed, and the TV shows that Ruby has just shot Oswald, and he's fallen to the floor there in the police station as they're transferring him from the police to the city jail. And um, I thought, well, so I got up, walked to the foot of my stairway, called up to my wife, and I said, I'm going to have to miss lunch because I've got to go to Parkland. They've just shot Oswald. So she called down and said, who is Oswald? I said, he's the man that they say shot President Kennedy. Oh, she said, well, we'll see you later. She was used to saying that. And so I got in my car, drove out toward Parkland, and on my way here, I saw another car approaching me and recognized that it was my chief of surgery's car, Dr. Shires, who had returned from the meeting in Galveston uh, on Friday. So we stopped our cars beside each other and let each other know what we had just heard about Oswald being shot at Parkland. And he turned his car around and we sped out to Parkland um, and parked behind the emergency room, got out, ran into the emergency room, and Mrs. Nelson, the nurse, was again on duty there. And she said he, that is pointing, that she knew who we were talking about, he's in there, pointing to trauma room two that was across the hall from where the president had been treated. Um, so we, Dr. Shires and I, looked into trauma room two, and there were many people in there working on Oswald, giving him blood transfusions, that sort of thing. And he was still very much alive. He was unconscious, but he was alive. And so we, Dr. Shires and I, went upstairs, changed into surgical scrubs, and by the time we did that, Oswald was on the operating table up in the operating room and ready for exploration. And Dr. Shires was the operating surgeon at that time. And um, we made a long incision in his abdomen. And what had happened to Oswald, unfortunately, uh, what gave him, I think, a fatal wound instead of a, maybe a non-fatal wound, is that when he saw Ruby walking toward him, naturally he tried to turn away from that pistol that he saw. And uh, the bullet, if he had not seen Ruby and had not turned, that would have gone straight through from the front to the back. Wouldn't have killed him, given him some serious injuries, but wouldn't have killed him probably. But as it was, he turned his left side toward the pistol and the bullet injured here and went across the back of his abdominal cavity and injured both his vena cava and his aorta. Uh, the two main blood vessels in the body. And that usually is fatal right there on the spot. But not in this case. It did not do that. And uh, so we were able to explore him. You can go ahead and, and turn, close that completely if you want. No, it's okay. Let's just go outside. That's wicked. Wicked. Yeah. Wicked. Okay. Anyway, um, he um, had that terrible injury then to those two blood vessels. And we were getting down to where uh, Dr. Shires could place uh, vascular clamps on those and maybe have a chance of repairing them. Uh, and just as we got to that point, though, he had a cardiac arrest also. He had lost so much blood, despite it being replaced, he'd had a lot of cardiac damage from the shock that he was in. And Dr. Perry and I dropped out of surgery, and Dr. Perry opened Oswald's chest, and we massaged his heart. And initially, it began to contract again very nicely. But then it soon stopped, and we got it going again, and it stopped and got it going. Anyway, for 20 or 25 minutes, we kept massaging his heart, Dr. Perry and I taking turns, until finally it became so flabby that it was clear 
it would never, rec you know, recover completely, and he was pronounced dead. So that's what happened there. I know you're a professional in the arts of, I mean, you see it, uh, everything cool. Very professional and very, you're still a human being, sir, and then you just, like, less than 48 hours ago, you were trying to save the, the, the life of the President of the United States, and then uh, by that time, the whole world oh, yeah. was bombarding him as the worst communist, the worst traitor, the man who killed the president. Here you're saving his life. I mean, didn't you think about the irony of those? Oh, yeah. Well, nobody knew where this, you know, who was the mastermind of all this. Nobody knew. In fact, we still don't know when you get right down to it. There are a lot of theories, but we don't know who was the mastermind. One of the books that I've got uh, is entitled LBJ, The Mastermind of the JFK shooting. Yeah, he thinks that. So. Yeah. Published about uh, three or four years ago. You have that book? Yeah. No, I said I believe that. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but mm -hmm. what go what goes through your mind? I mean I mean did you thought about it? Did you thought I mean let me pinch this guy's heart so he could suffer a little bit? I mean what goes through your mind uh, on that? Situation? There again, you don't think. You just go into your treatment mode and you're not thinking about what you should be doing with that. You the only thing you're thinking is what do I do medically? You know, you're not making any value judgments about whether this man deserves to die or not. That doesn't enter your mind one bit. Did he say anything? No. Well, that, there's an interesting comment about that. Um, the detective, uh, a man named Level, uh, who was accompanying him out of the jail uh, and standing right next to him. He wasn't handcuffed to him, but he was just standing next to him when he was shot. And uh, Mr. Level was sitting outside the operating room as we were operating on Oswald, waiting to see what happened. So when he died, we came back out and sat down next to Mr. Level uh, in the nurse's station there in the operating room. And he told us what he did uh, as soon as Oswald was shot. He said when he fell to the floor, he said, I got down on my hands and knees and put my face right down in his. And I said, son, you're hurt real bad. Would you like to say anything to me now? The detective said that to Oswald. He said Oswald had his eyes closed, but then he opened his eyes real wide, looked up at Mr. Level for a long few moments, Mr. Level said. And then after, like he was thinking over what he was going to say, he shook his head like that, as far as he could shake it from side to side, closed his eyes, and that was the last he ever opened them. Mr. Level said, I'll believe till the day I die that he was uh, thinking about giving me some critical information about what had happened and what, you know, he was thinking about that. But he never did it. We'll never know. We'll never know why. Um, lastly, Doctor, and I appreciate it. I mean, it's like, like you said, this belongs to the world, and this yeah. doesn't belong to him, this doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to this company. I hope I could do, I only could pray to God that I could do a good job transmitting this to people that speak another language that uh, you're, that you're native English, yeah, well. and that um, they loved uh, President Kennedy and people that grew up studying about the situation that want to understand. I mean, my purpose is not to enhance any type of particular theory. My, hand, my, my purpose is to, you know, thank God that you're alive. Thank God that you have a perspective, I guess, is unique to this world. Uh, why do you think it's important after 50 years to still try to dig into the truth? Or does it really doesn't make any difference whether one shooter, three shooters, four shooters, or five shooters? Why is it important to keep digging? Well, of course, what I think about it is just what any private person would think about it. I don't have any special expertise in that regard. But my own personal feeling about it is that it's still important. And the reason it is because um, we need to um, keep an eye on what's happening uh, in our various countries, you know, you and yours and I and mine. And we can't, what is it, someone once said, I can't remember who it was, that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And I think that uh, that's something I've thought of ever since this is. And who set this up? What, you know, brought this about? And um, there have been more than 3,200 books written about this and the various theories about who was behind this. 
Uh, one of the better ones that I've seen, I've got it in my briefcase over there now, was published about three years ago um, by uh, James Douglas. And it's called L, um, JFK and the Unspeakable, Why He Died and Why It Matters. Uh, and it's very well done, I think, uh, very, um, you know, not sensationalist, uh, but just a very reasonable view of what happened. Um, and that's a rather complicated story. But basically, uh, he presents data that he thinks, um, on three different occasions at least, um, President Kennedy thwarted the desire of some people in the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the CIA to make a first nuclear strike against the Russians before they hit us. And on three occasions, uh, Kennedy knew about this and got on the back line with Khrushchev and sort of poured oil on the water and took away the excuse that the Joint Chiefs thought they might have for making this first strike. And if they had, we probably would not be sitting here where we are today. So I think Kennedy maybe saved all of us on perhaps three different occasions. And this is, of course, not uh, holy writ that's in this book, but it's a reasonable supposition, I think. Dr. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time, sir. And uh, before my good friend uh, starts bombarding you. Thank you so much for my friends here. Want to take a picture with you as well? Yeah. One, two, three.